Welcome to the Service MVP Podcast, and my name is Joe Crisera, America's Service Sales Coach, and I have with me a very special guest, Mr. Troy Aberly, who is the Executive Strategy Officer at Chet Holmes International. Troy, uh, Troy welcome to the program. How are you doing today? I'm doing amazing, Joe. Thank you so much for having me. Well, you know, the reason I have you here, and you probably don't even know, I'm kind of uh, kind of uh, blindsiding you on this one, but I am a Chet Holmes uh the ultimate sales machine fanboy, and I have been for years. And uh, you know, if I uh, if I could have ever talked to Chet when he was alive, it would have been a high one of the highest honors to ever meet him. And I definitely welcome you here because you know uh, I think we have the same thing in mind, which is to the motivation to help other people uh, by communicating high value. So Troy, welcome to the show here. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. Yes, I'd definitely honored to uh, to be carrying out the legacy and working alongside Amanda Holmes to to keep uh, showcasing the strategies that have had an impact on so many lives around the world, uh, including my own. Well, let's go ahead and do a couple things. One, let's give people a little bit of a thumbnail about what this organization is with the Ultimate Sales Machine and Chet Holmes International. And uh, and then secondly, let's see if we can provide some content to help people uh, along the way. What do you think of that? Oh, I love that, for sure. Let's do, it. Let's do those two things. So why don't you give us a little uh, thumbnail about the organization and what you guys do and uh, how you strive to help people. No, for it. Thank you. Chat Homes International has, you know, been serving about a quarter million companies, uh, literally from around the globe and in every kind of industry you could possibly think of. Uh, to date, Amanda's best uh, calculation is around that 59 to $60 billion have been, uh, done, grown in business or done in business, if you will, because of the strategies that are found in the ultimate sales machine. And those, there's the ultimate sales machine is a book that was, uh, produced uh, many years ago. It was a best-selling author, uh, best-selling book, and one of the most sought-after marketing books of all time. And recently, Amanda took that book last year, in fact, and rewrote that book and uh, kept a lot of the materials that her father had provided, but then also added a new spin onto some really cool uh, things that have really changed um, the way that people have read that book and the way they're implementing it today. And so that book, again, has become a best-selling uh, book and still helping, uh, you know, communities and of people around the world. It translated into, I believe it's 16 languages now. Most recently, uh, Italian was added to it. Mm. Well, I can tell you one thing. I'm one of the people who have benefited from that book myself. And uh, this business here at Service MVP uh, wouldn't be what it is without the uh, material that uh, – the founder Chet Holmes had written, and definitely, I, when I look at the Mount Rushmore of people that I were influencing me, I'd say Stephen Covey's in one of those places, uh, Chet Holmes in another place, Jack Canfield, and uh, I'm still looking for a fourth one, but you never know, it might show, might show up. But I, there's a lot, a lot of other ones who, who I could put in there. But definitely, you know, it's definitely this material that you teach it, that you've taken and modernized and you know brought it to today's standards because you know the, the, some of the values and things don't change and the principles don't change but the way we present it into today's society it is different it is, does take a difference right well, but Chet what it had the ability of using fax machines joe and so even though we did a campaign a few months ago that it actually worked on fax machines that were still there for doctors it's uh we had to update a, a, a few things Chet, for those who don't know, uh, worked with Warren Buffett, sorry, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's partner when he first got his start. And then you might know, also know him from uh, his work with Tony Robbins back in the day. They had uh, created Business Mastery together. Wow. Well, that is some uh, high, high, uh, high, uh, high company to be involved with there for sure. And definitely, I'm, that's why I'm so honored to have you on here today. And I'm a, I'm a big fanboy. So definitely... Uh, it's going to be a home game for I your guess. organization, for sure. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the things that you saw have changed. Can you go ahead and tell us some of the things that uh, that people can be aware of that you've seen as you guys have rewritten the material and updated it for today's consumer? Uh, what are some of the things that you noticed that were have changed the most? You know, one of the things that's definitely changed, you think back to then, you know, we had, you know, six or seven mediums to grab the attention of our buyer. Today, we're over 20. And so what's really happening is, is there's you know enough research now that's showing that people are, it's getting harder and harder to actually get the attention of your ideal client. Not only just that, but also the fact that we, it's getting 
overloading for a lot of customers. And if you know, when we were at uh, HubSpot, Amanda and I spoke there last year, and they had brought up that topic was, you know, people are burned out. And so it's getting harder and harder. In in some ways, it's easier to reach your customer because there's so much more technology, but it's getting harder amongst so much noise. And I think that's one of the big things that I think, um, you know, has trans, transformed over the, the years. Is how to get how to stand out from the, how to how to yeah. make a di- a differentiation to make sure you are doing that. In some ways, that is hard. In some ways, it's easy, right? But 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 again, but all the different channels can sometimes dilute uh, that message, and that is an interesting uh, concept there. Yeah, because back then, I remember I, probably back in the day when I first started writing stuff, we were still talking about how to use a pa- alpha pager or whatever, mm-hmm. or whatever kind of a thing. That was like yeah. one of the channels we used to communicate with our salespeople. Rush right? over but, to uh, a payphone to get the message from your pager, right? <laughs> Or your back phone, the the back phone back in the day, yeah. the big back phone in it. But so definitely, uh, uh, some, some of those things out there. But there's a lot of things that have stayed the same, right? And so let's let's talk about some of those things that are universal. So let's talk about the universal truths of the sales uh, of the of this uh, program. You know that what you guys have created, the ultimate, you know, sales machine here, and how some universal truths that have stayed in place over the years. Let's, that's what I'm really probably more interested in. Is that and some sure. of the that you could you could bring our view our listeners to see what are some of the things that they can do uh, in that uh, in that kind of a format that would help them? Well, you know, Amanda and I chunked it down, uh, Joe, and, and this might help your audience as well. If I could explain something of the book did it d- does exactly what it's supposed to do and and educates people on so many cool strategies and really makes things um, uh, exciting. But what we did was we found out time and time again that people weren't always implementing everything and found it overwhelming or confusing. So we chunked it down into a four-part framework. And so for your audience today, if you really thought about your business, try to score yourself in four key areas. Number one is going to be do you have a clear goal actually identified for your company, both in a financial perspective for the business, but also something for yourself personally? And how do those two align to make sure that everything is really crystal clear? And does everyone in your company actually understand where you're taking the this team and, uh, and, and the outcomes that you're going to achieve? Number two, do you truly understand your dream client? Chad taught us the Dream 100 system that's in the book. And what that really means is identifying the most profitable customers. I'm talking customers that are going to get you to your goal, both mentally and financially. And what can you really identify about those people? I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Number three, what are you saying to grab the attention of those buyers in a way that stands out differently from your competitors? If you go on any website right now, if someone that's competing with you, please tell me if you can find a difference. A lot of times people are saying the same thing and that's what's drowning you out. There's no difference. Then on the second part of that, number three is, how are you educating those buyers in a way that resets the buying criteria and actually tells them why should they care about your product or service? And so that you can give that education rather than say it and spray it. Number four is how are you deploying that message? Where are you saying it? When are you saying it? How many times are you following up? And and if you think back now in reverse, what are we saying? Where are we saying it? With the right education, the right pitch, and to which clients Are they getting us to our goal or are they keeping us from it? And I think when you can boil it down into that four-part framework, Joe, it's very important. The next part I'm just going to add to that that I said I'd come back to is when we take a look at our dream client, I think salespeople and for a lot of the business owners today could admit it's getting harder and harder to find salespeople that know how to build rapport. And building rapport isn't anything um, and I'm not picking on any salespeople. I mean, we kind of told everybody to stop building rapport, stop shaking hands, stop going and visiting people with, you know, the pandemic. But if we take a look back to really the, the basics of the seven steps of selling, the first thing that we should be spending most time on is building rapport. And it seems to be something that we're spending the least amount of time on. We're spending the most amount of time on closing. And that to me was a big shift that, that to realize that that was happening. It's something that we need to keep standard, Joe. This is why I had you on here because uh, I, I have a saying, my, in, in my saying is that people are more important than things. And so focusing on the things we're selling or focusing on the things that people need 
first uh, it just goes it, it's no, that doesn't differentiate because the, the things that people need and the things that go are not, not working are things that everybody has already. So the things that we bring, which is this uh, person to manage the project and the relationship we create with people, to me, that's like the that's a knife that cuts through the fog of uncertainty when it comes to people buying. What do you think of that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> And, uh, and the thing is, is to, to build that rapport with people, people want to know that you actually understand what keeps them up at night, right? And so when you can get really researched and figure out your client and be uh, prepared to, to n understand that, now you, you can, like, number one is to, to build rapport. Number two is to find needs. Well, if you can be, in a way, proving that you've already understood their needs and what does that need translate into it as an emotional response, whether that's depression, stress. I mean, you look at 82% of companies and C-suites right now, executives are dealing with overload, overwhelm, you know, and they want to actually leave their position because they don't know what else to do. Guess what? That translates into a few interesting things. 73% of their staff said that they don't like working there anymore. It's still carrying on the great resignation. And divorce rates are up at high for people who are in construction and agriculture because there's so much stress. Mm -hmm. So my point being is, if we got to figure this part out of building rapport and, and getting more excitement back in our workforce or in the, and for your audience so that we can have that same experience then for other people. And I think that's really important to do that. So if you understand their needs, that's a big piece. Number three then is really, you know, building value and four, creating desire. Number five should be objections and number six should be close. But the point being is we've, we've gotten past that to quickly try to use AI, try to use assumption, per, the perception of other people of your, of, of just what you hear to try to get to that close part. But I think we got to get back to build rapport and find people's needs. Joe, I think is what's been missing for a few years now. Well, I think if you can uh, build rapport, <clears throat> make those needs customized and personal to the person you're selling it to, then the desire and interest, it becomes very apparent. And then the closing is something that just occurs. It's not something that we need to force, uh, which is like, that's why I really believe in it. When people, when people ask me, you know, Joe, how did you come up with this concept of differentiating yourself so much? I would say, well, go read the, uh, uh, the you know, the ultimate sales machine and you'll see uh, where that information is located. Because of course, you know, we have I have a whole another channel I opened up that uh, expands on that truth. But when I read that, it was like, man, this this guy is teach, he's talking to me in the language I understand there. So I was getting a solution myself, and I had interest and desire. Because if you told me I should be in sales, I would say, no way. I hate I hate sales. I would never <laughs> never never want to be in that kind of a job. But you know. Uh, now that I meet great people like you and Amanda, people like that, I am hardened that not a, that, that sales isn't what I thought it was. It's something that's uh, in, in the motivation of helping other people. And I think finding a solution that's right for everybody, that's really what we're talking about here. Uh, tell us about some of the stuff, the, the bigger pictures of that you guys do that we don't do, like time management and things like that. I see right in the very beginning, it starts with something like that. Could you give us some of the things, some of the, broad, the broader things that people can do uh, to become, uh, to make sure that they're being more effective throughout their day? You know, I, I think it, this is a great question. I think when you have that clarity of where it is that you're going, start to take a look throughout your day, even if you put a timer in your phone. And uh, this was things that I did because I didn't realize you know, where I was going wrong until I started to reflect and journal on it. And so as a leader, what I did was I started to put a timer in my phone for every two hours. And it just said, look back and was your time brown or green? And brown was stuff that was going to remove me from my goal and green was going to move me towards it. And I realized how much messing around I was doing. And I think that that's something about, you know, Chad talked about, you know, things about, do you got them in at meetings? Cutting some of those things out. You know, I check my emails once a day now, Joe, instead of, um, I wouldn't check my own house mail uh, 45 times a day, but you become mm -hmm. consumed in everyone else's problems. And it's not that they're not important, but, you know, I, I think it's really taking a look at where you're spending your time today. You know what you're doing wrong. It's just sometimes closing that knowing and doing gap and taking a look at where your time really gets spent, where can you delegate and what are expectations that you need to communicate to your team to be able to say, here's where we're going. Here's your job and what I need you to own. Here's what I'm going to be doing and owning. 
let's work on that together to get that goal achieved at the same time. Sometimes uh, through the elimination of some of those channels, right? Because there's so email, text, every yeah. telegram, you name it. There's so many different things that people can contact each other with. I think sometimes you have to be smart enough to say no to some of the channels. What do you think of that? Is that oh, <laughs> am I, am I going in the wrong direction to. there? No, but sometimes you're actually helping that, that, especially you look at some employees that need always that second uh, help from you. You know, you identify those people and just give them a shot more and make them feel more comfortable with taking shots at it and messing up. Teach them how to actually reach out to you for guidance and training. And then what mm -hmm. I would do is you're pushing them to to learn and do their own thing and grow. But they'll do that easier when they have that communication and that uh, that reward from you. Tell us a little bit about uh, one of the things I really love is in the book, it talks about, you know, the nitty gritty of getting the best buyers, right? Because, uh, you know, if you get the best person who's going to purchase, it makes sales a way easier to have the make. It's like uh, you know, lubricate, you know, it's like sliding uh, grease on it. You could just, everything just kind of slides through like that. Could you talk a little bit more about that? So, uh, so I think, you know, if you way. went back, yeah, if you went into your balance sheet or your income statement, took a look at everybody that buys from you. The 80-20 rule is really where this applies. 80% of your uh, customers probably only give you 20% of your revenue. And in that group, they're probably also the biggest headache. You spend most of your time with those people. So if you start to identify what the 20% are that are giving you 80% of your profit, you'll realize that a lot of times you don't even speak that much to those people. You perfectly aligned with those people. They're always looking for some way of growing with you and, uh, and buying more from you. They know, like, and trust you. Take a look at what those characteristics are, where those people hang out and what do they do and focus on those types of people and start to say who you're not going to work with. Because to me, there's a to-do list, <clears throat> there's a not to-do list. And I think that um, identifying, and also there's a customer list and there's a non-ideal customer list. <laughs> so it's getting, really figuring out those types of people mm -hmm. that make getting to your goal the easiest. Well, you know, I don't want to have you read the whole book to us on this interview, but I, I would feel bad if I didn't get you to at least help us reveal this one. Uh, this is the the biggest mistakes that everyone makes when they're presenting presenting to their their uh, clients, whether they're presenting problems or solutions. Uh, could you give us a few of those tips? Uh, uh, give people a little taste of what they would get if they were to get uh, uh, this uh, book that you, this uh, this famous book. What do you think? You know, in, in our book and then also in our courses or whether or not we help people with the framework for their company, what typically happens is people walk up and they just spray everything that they think that the customer needs to hear. And it's a hopeful sales message. We call that the stadium pitch. If I put you, Joe, into a stadium today or, you know, someone who's running an HVAC company from your audience and I said, here's a hundred of your best customers, what would you say? Most people walk out there and they don't know what to say. They freeze or they make it all about them. And it's the exact same message as what everyone else is doing. What we're saying is let's take a look at how to combine data and story, put those two things together to really grab the attention of the buyer. Now, for instance, myself at John Deere, most of us were walking out and saying, hey, we have low interest rates. Um, you know, we get a sleeve of golf balls and a hat if you buy a new tractor, right? It, 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 we, we, there's nothing really all that different, right? You know, free inspections or uh, free trucking, what have you. But when I walked out and and I said to them, hey, you know, here's the five top reasons why your farm could lose revenue, that changed it. Because for me, this is where Amanda and Chet were different, Joe, is she started talking to me more about this global pain and what customers are actually dealing with so I could get on their level and grab their attention. And that just that this book created $42 million in sales for me because I started to really understand that it's the way you relate to people up front that's going to build that rapport and keep them listening for longer term. So be careful of if everybody can go check their websites, do a control F. And if you've got me, we, and I in it all over the front cover, no one's <laughs> reading it. <laughs> so make it about them is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, you know, I like that. I like that because you're providing value <clears throat> that goes beyond the product that you're actually offering. I would say that 95% of value is created beyond the solution. Uh, would you agree sure. with that? That, that, that most, most of the solution is created beyond the actual item or service that we're actually yeah. selling? How do you think of that? 
Amanda and I, I mean, we, we've been doing a lot of work in the, uh, in the biohacking community. And, you know, the way we got a lot of people's attention was, is we reached out to all the vendors and said, here's the top six ways to screw up your trade show. Right. So we're talking about something that has nothing to do with us. We don't do trade shows. I mean, we do marketing and, and, and business mm -hmm. uh, strategies, but people are looking at it as we're helping them with the problem that they're having and we can give them data and curriculum on that. And that really built up a whole new sense of trust. And then when we got to the actual conference, people are already saying, thank you. Wow. We would have missed out on this. And so it, it, it just builds a lot of uh, value when you actually do serve people with things that, you know, are an opportunity to, to win real quick. You know, I'm smiling so much right now. Cause I, uh, what I always say is that what I really learned in this book and the ultimate sales machine is that uh, everything I've always needed was right in front of me the whole time. I just wasn't looking at it the same way. And that's really what I got from the book. Uh, my my point of view is that uh, there's everything I needed was right here the entire time. Uh, but then, you know, the way you express that is a different way. It's like uh, those problems have always been there, but people are, uh, they're hesitant to talk about the problems that people have. Uh, cause to me, there's no, no reason for a solution without problems. Right. And so, uh, introducing material where it does introduce problems for people does make you see like, this is a person who's a source of a solution. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit more about the relationship between, uh, like those, that periodicals you talk about are talking about, uh, obviously that dissonance that people have that cognitive dissonance inside of them. How important of an element do you guys feel that is to differentiating your services? You have to, otherwise no one's going to pay attention to you and you don't feel relatable. You know, and I think when you can change something that's, again, turning it into emotion. I'm Joe, I'm going to give you an example, if I could, for one of your HVAC customers. Mm -hmm. But for most HVAC companies that are in the residential or commercial, let's go to apartment buildings. What are they saying to people? We have 24-hour service, right? We have experienced technicians. No one's going to write anything different. They're not going to say we only work 18 hours a day and and we have really well-trained people. But here's what you could actually say to people. You could say to them, we are the reason why you won't get divorced uh, as a real estate investor. People are going to pay attention, right? Real estate investors on there. And you can say, because typically heaters and HVAC units fail at 9 p.m. on a Friday night. And your spouse has said, are you, do you really have to spend all weekend at that darn building again? Right. Oh, wow. that's, that's and you amazing. can say, here's the top five things you must consider before even thinking of hiring your next contractor. And you could start to actually educate them on the top pieces. And that's what we do is we look for the, the emotional side of it. Because now the person who is, has just got their ring thrown at them a couple nights ago is going to take a look at your ad saying, this person gets me. And it's a subconscious play. Like in a way, in a way, it's like you try to do the same thing I do, which is have people say, is this guy living rent free in my mind? Is this, uh, like, I feel like I've no, this guy must know me. Does he have a camera in my, there's a camera in my office or something? Like How does that, he know Joe. that, right? That's kind of like that, right? Rent free. I'm going to use that. He's, he's living rent free in my head. How the heck does yeah. this guy know? You know, uh, and that's really what I uh, love about the material. And when people ask me, I know people are going to say, well, why is Joker sorry having, isn't, uh, you know, Chet Holmes International a competitor? And I say, no, they're not. They're, uh, oh. my feeling is that, I want to make people so successful they can afford to hire me and Chet Holmes International uh, yeah. because because that's really what it is. The more we invest in ourselves, and you know some of the things you just talked about there, which go into marketing, which I dip, typically have a dim view of marketers who say they're going to increase sales. Right. And this this is something I believe where marketing will increase sales because you're you're lay, you're laying down the carpet for the salesperson to walk in yeah. and uh, and provide this this and they talk about the problem and talk about the solutions. Uh, tell us about that a little bit about how, uh, how 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 making it easier for salespeople. That's really the well. The I think a lot of companies, in. Joe, try to you know they what companies do today is is often they'll they'll come up with a product or service thinking that someone really needs it, but they've never really studied it or tied the emotional chemistry to that spot. And so what I'm getting at is there is if you actually went out and found, or take a look at what it is that you love doing product or service, then go out to the person who you think actually needs it. Study the emotional problems that they're dealing with every day. Cause they don't want to take on more of your stuff. They don't, they honestly don't care. They're just trying to get to five o'clock and hopefully get to, to, junior's baseball game, right? 
the the truth is is you need to find out if your product or service can actually reduce the the stress that's going on in their business and accelerate them to the goals that they really want because a lot of people don't in business today are just it's always reactive and for all you maintenance people out there you should be teaching people how to prevent something you know is going to fail and the way you do that is you start to look at the pain parts first people will spend more time avoiding pain that's what will make their buying decision is to avoid pain versus gain pleasure you bought your new car whether it's a porsche i don't care you 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 bought that car because you didn't want to break down anymore you didn't want people to think you weren't successful you wanted to get that date night back as romantic as it was 20 years ago whatever that might be but you didn't want to give up something right yes there's pleasure but the first key is actually avoiding pain. So if you can actually focus on finding out from your ideal customer, what are the things that keep them up at night? Ask them, what keeps you up at night in your personal life and in your professional life? And when you start asking detailed questions like that, you're going to start to figure out, you know what? We don't offer anything that can help this person. Or, holy, we haven't even told them that we offer this. It's actually sad how many people never take this time, Joe. And then they hope that their salesperson can work 70, 80 hours a week mm, trying to it. figure it out. So if we lay that out so that we have emotional tie to it, the salesperson now just needs to come in and reaffirm what's been laid out because all the connections have been made and they need to, to illustrate to the client that their next move is going to be pleasure that will avoid pain. Well, so many people focus on, you know, uh, who should, who's going to do my website or who's going to do my uh, Facebook ads, who's going to do all these different channels. Right. But what I keep saying to people is, listen, no matter what the channel, you have to have the message and the communication inside that channel. So don't blame the channel. Oh, pay per click doesn't work, or Facebook ads don't work, or email stop. Email doesn't work anymore. What doesn't work to me is exactly what you're saying here, which is you're not communicating a, a something that creates value in the mind of the buyer, and that's really something I think that. The channel is less important than whatever it is you're communicating. That's why I highly endorse. You can take the sound boy if you want to, if you want to, Troy. <laughs> What's that? For you, for you, so you can take the sound boy. I'm going I'm to give you the <laughs> sound boy right here. Uh, this is why Chet Holmes International is needed for every business to communicate uh, value whenever you go into any channel to speak to your customers publicly. And I really feel that's true. As a matter of fact, I'll give you a, I'll give you a little, here's the thing I'll tell everybody that they don't even know. I, probably, I don't think I've ever said this before, but I had a thing that I, as a result of your, of your, that book that Chet Holmes wrote, I wrote an ad for myself when I was a heating and cooling contractor that said the, the dirty little secrets your builder doesn't want you to know about why your second floor doesn't cool. And I, and because it was a subdivision, it was a subdivision it, it was called, called, called Ravinia Woods in Gurney, Illinois. There was like 700 homes and the second floor couldn't possibly cool because the duck was way too small going to it. And I said, uh, let's give them the dirty little secrets. The builder doesn't want you to know as to why. And man, out, out of out of 700 homes, we put, that, we put that out there. Listen to this. It was the Chet Holmes uh, International uh, what case study, if you will. We had 700 homes. We sent a 15 cent postcard back then uh, six times throughout the year. We had 425 responses to that postcard. We sold over uh, $8 million with that uh, the technology. That's why I was so proud to have you here because not only am I just interviewing you as a third party, I'm a user of this technology. Your and product definitely of the product, Joe. The product of the product, exactly. And that's why I can speak to it. And I can highly recommend and endorse the Chet Holmes International Organization uh, because I myself have benefited greatly and I've made millions uh, from this information myself. Good for you, man. That's really good. And you you nailed it. <laughs> and I, it. But and so for anybody listening, you think that that was an old thing. That exact same thing can work again today. And guess what? None of your competition is doing it. And by the way, you know what's crazy, Joe? Everybody claims they hate uh, cold calls. So go get really good at cold calls. Lots. Of, you, you have no competition. No one else likes doing them. But you just reaching out and talking to a customer tomorrow, reach out and grab, talk to five customers and ask them what's keeping them up at night and finding out, you know, ways that your products and services can help them. And if they don't, you might have to realign a few things. But don't well, just sit and wait for it to happen because it's not going to happen. The universe rewards those who take action. 
uh, Troy, definitely, I, I believe in that 100%. And definitely, that's what we're going to talk about right now. How can people take action uh, to get to know Chet Holmes International and be able to uh, find some of the solutions? Again, again, this is not a service MVP competitor. This is something where you're going to keep, I would say, Chet Holmes International and what you guys do, it sells the service before you even get to the home, before you even, before the doorbell, before the doorbell rings, you guys are selling the service before the doorbell rings. Uh, we sell the service. We're in the weeds on this. We're, we're like, okay, after the doorbell rings, how are we going to take this and make this into reality and get it across the goal line? So just a small piece of what you guys do, we teach here, which is when you're in the home, how are you going to take these things, right. these things that the company's promised and then uh, bring them to life, right? So tell us a little bit about how people can take action to uh, be able to use your service, if you don't mind. For sure. I mean, chetholmes.com is definitely one of the, our websites. Go to the ultimate sales and uh, and there, you'll find a spot in there where you can actually download chapter four as well. And, and you can get a taste of the, the book. Uh, that chapter is, is one of my favorites. Uh, a little bragging. I, I'm in the chapter because it's that chapter that helped me make $42 million in seven months when I thought the world was crashing. So go to, you know, take a look at all the strategies that Amanda put in there. Um, my, my own email, Joe, is troy at chatholmes.com. And I look forward to, to helping any of your audience, uh, get more clarity, but it, it's, it's, the framework is simple. Four steps. Uh, do that 4,000 times. Don't do 4,000 things four times. And that's mm. the information right from chat. And, uh, and I take that very seriously. So if you, if you nail those pieces down, you will win. I, I can promise that. Well, I can tell you one thing, Troy, just by talking to you and hearing you for the past uh, half an hour here, is that you definitely embody the opposite of what people think of traditional salespeople. And uh, I can see in your heart, you're just here to help people and to uh, share some of those stories that you went through, right? And uh, Any other final words or final thoughts you want people to know before we wrap this up here, Troy? You know, it's easy to say to people, don't give up. But if you get really calibrated in what you truly want to achieve in your company, and bring everybody together in your company to tell them where you want to go work through framework like this because it's these there's so many great businesses and there's so much opportunity out there especially in the trades world oh my gosh joe you know really take a look at your client and get to get back to building rapport with them and they will when you're a kind person to them as a team those clients will tell you what it will take to to serve them and think big, push yourself to four times or 10 times or 20 times, whatever you thought was possible, push, push far and find tools that guys like Joe have to help really make that, that process really efficient. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much, Troy. And we're going to be able to wrap this up. Anybody who wants to uh, get more information, you'll see uh, the information. I'll, a link will be in our uh, podcast uh, webpage and you'll be able to get the link uh, to the ultimate uh, sales machine and be able to get that chapter that he uh, Troy promised you and be able to use this information. I truly hope everybody does take advantage of it because I do feel it is uh, one of the best things I've ever been involved with. So thank you so much again, Troy, for being here. Thank you, Joe. And thank you to all of your audience. Thank you so much.